Good morning. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Oh, praise the name.
Lord, be with us in this service today. We pray that what we do is sing the name of Jesus and sing your praise and honor you in all that we do. Be with us. Bless those that are here. Bless those that are home and not feeling well. Be with us all as one body. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Have a seat just for a second. We will stand up, get around, and greet, you, greet each other in just a minute. But it's good to see you. If you're visiting with us for the first time or first time in a while, there are some connection cards in the pew in front of you. We'd like to ask you to fill that out. And then at the end of the service, the offering boxes are out in the hallway. And um, let that be your record uh, of your attendance today. And, and um, if you have a need, staff will be glad to pray along with you. So if you have something there, you can list that on that card as well. Glad to see you this morning. I hope that we can all just get up, move around a little bit, shake somebody's hand, and find somebody that you're not familiar with and go introduce yourself, tell them you're glad to see them. Let's stand together. Guys are going to play, and then we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to sing, okay? Let's turn around and greet each other.
E, would you turn to someone and tell them how glad you are to see them this morning? I know a bunch of our folks are uh, sick and out today, so it is good to see uh, you all here this morning, and I hope you've come ready to learn and dive into the Word of God. Real quick, before I forget, next Sunday is our Back to School Bash at the Wilkes uh, Cabin. So would love to see you and your families come. We're going to have a volleyball tournament, kickball tournament for the kiddos. Uh, just a great time. I've been instructed that they are going to provide the hot dogs and hot dog buns. So if you would please bring a finger food, that would help on the food uh, cost or uh, everybody eating something. Just bring a finger food whenever you come. Also, um, before I forget, our missions t-shirts, we're having a sale uh, to raise money for missions projects. You can see the, the shirt here. It's comfort colors in adult sizes. Uh, if you would like to, to buy one, you can see myself, Rick, Tim, Kelly, any of the staff folks after the service would be glad to get those for you. They are comfort colors. So they're a little bit bigger sizes than maybe uh, some of your other apparel things, but they're really, really comfortable and they look okay too. All right. Um, so be free. Be feel blah, blah, feel free to grab one of those and talk to us after the service today. Um, we are continuing in our sermon series through First and Second Timothy, and we're going to go a little bit extended beyond that on a sermon series we are calling Blueprints: What God Has Designed, the Plan that God Has in Place for What a Healthy Church Looks Like. Our first week we covered the church and the gospel. How a healthy church must be built on the foundation and the truth of the gospel. And in 1 Timothy 1, Paul warns Timothy, his son in the faith, his protege, his hand-picked guy who was going to pastor the church in Ephesus. He warned Timothy that there were going to be leaders that came that swerved away from the gospel. Literally, they were aiming at the wrong goal. So Paul warns of this. In order to prevent this, you must, Timothy, the church must be focused on the gospel. And we, as a church, if we are not careful, it is likely for us to swerve to other things, good, well-meaning things. But if it pulls away from the gospel, it pulls away from the mission of this church. Last week, we looked at the church in prayer and how we, as a church, you, as an individual, should be devoted to praying. We should be centered on, our very heartbeat should be toward communicating to God who wants to hear us, hear from us, and who can And we talked about how we need to bring things before God who only through the power of God can move in situations in our life. Today, we're looking at the church and its leadership. Before we jump in this morning, I want to make a connection, what, what I was just using there on recapping, but making a connection for Paul because this is so important for him here in this letter. Paul is saying that we must prioritize the gospel because it must drive the preaching and teaching ministries of the church. And if we compromise on the gospel and swerve to other things, it causes a dangerous moment for the church. Likewise, if we as a church, if you as a Christian sway, swerve away from praying to God, if that's the last resort rather than a first priority in your life, it causes a dangerous principle for you in your Christian life and for us as a church. We must acknowledge that God needs to move in certain situations because it is only through the power of God that people are going to come to know Christ, that marriages are going to be transformed, that kids are going to be saved. It is only through the power of the gospel and the power of prayer that these things happen. And Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that in order for the church to continue to prioritize those things, it must have a solid foundation in its leadership. Its leadership must protect and prioritize the gospel and prayer. And so I'm trying to say all of this to to kind of set the foundation for the logical conclusion that Paul is trying to build here. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is making some very large moments in the church life. In church's life in Ephesus and for us moving forward for every church after. We must be built on these areas. And the church's leadership must understand this. And the church's leadership must guard and protect. And the church's leadership must prioritize these things. This is Paul's conclusion here. And again, it is almost every week I feel like I'm saying this. But it's such a daunting task to stand before you. 
and to preach on these things. Where if I look at these things, and as we were about to read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I look and examine my own life, trying to see whether or not I fulfill these things. It is a humbling thing to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 as a pastor. It is a humbling thing, I hope and I pray for you as churches to look at me and Rick in your own lives and examine whether we meet these qualities. It is humbling for you and deacons and their wives and for you as a church to look at the deacons in this church and see whether or not they fit these qualities. It is humbling and daunting to look at these things. It's not a prideful way to stand up and boast and saying that I am all of these things or Rick is all of these things. It is a humbling moment to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and examine my own life in light of the Word of God. And it should be important for you as a church. This is not a Sunday to tune out. Although there may be a lot of notes that I've put up to try and help organize all the thought things that are going on in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and including Titus and including Acts and including 1 Peter, it's daunting to try and do all of this in a clear and simple way. It has been challenging this week to look at all of these things in light of our culture, in light of a lot of hot topics that are going on in several denominations, and especially in the Southern Baptist Convention that just happened, looking at what qualifies to be a pastor, who can be qualified to be a pastor. So without any further delay, I want to jump into the text and get started this morning. I want to read all of 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then we're going to kind of jump off of that to give notes that kind of summarize the umbrella of what Timothy is saying here. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Paul says, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household well, how will he care for the God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must as well, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Verse 8, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, not sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confessed in the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Will you join me in prayer? God, we lift up your name high and mighty this morning. God, I pray that you will remove me, that your word will speak clearly to your people here this morning. God, that as we examine these things, we will not drift. Our minds will stay focused on your word, stay focused on what you would have for us to learn this morning because this is such an important task. It is such an important moment for us as a church to make sure that our leadership is healthy here at this church and in every church we may have in our lives. God, we pray this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Two things that we see this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, two offices that Timothy outlines for us this morning. The first one is of pastors. I'm going to refer to them as pastors because that is much more our church's language of what we call people in today's society. We call them pastors. But throughout scripture, the term pastor, elder, overseer, some of your translations maybe even include bishop. All of these titles are for one office that Paul lists out. When you examine all of scripture, every single one of those terms is used to refer to what we call the pastor. So as we look at the pastors, here are things that we are going to see. 
Every single time a pastor is mentioned, the office of pastor is mentioned, it is always mentioned in the plural. You never ever in scripture see pastor of a church. Timothy is the pastor of a church, but he is one of many pastors according to what Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and what Paul continues in 2 Timothy chapter 2. There are multiple pastors that go on in every single church. In order to understand in the truest sense of what scripture is talking about, the pastor was never meant to be held by a single person. Yet we drift away from this. Not necessarily good or bad. It's just this is what our culture has done. But according to scripture, if we're following it as closely as we possibly can, pastor is always plural. The office is always held by multiple people. I think there are some good things to that. Accountability. There's some good things to that in diver- division of ministry to make sure that one person is not becoming overburdened by the work of the ministry that is going on in the church. That's not always the case in every church that you go to where there are multiple pastors, where there are multiple people able to preach and teach the word of God. And it's a great thing that we here at this church have that right now. It's not always been the case and it may not always be moving forward, but it's been a healthy dynamic of what this church has been able to build. What Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, when he's talking about this multiplicity of pastors, he says this, And when you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, Paul is encouraging Timothy to get, go, you go get and entrust faithful men to be able to be elders so that they can be able to teach others also. Because you need this, Timothy, or else you're going to burn out. Remember here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is warning Timothy that if you don't get some help, you're going to want to leave. You're already wanting to leave, Timothy. You're already wanting to run away because the church is getting hard. Stay. Make sure that you stay rooted in the church in Ephesus, Timothy. I have a great job for you to do. So this is why Paul is encouraging this over and over and over again. This is why it's encouraging for me and for us as a church to make sure that we are engaging in leadership development. So we're engaging for the next person to take your place behind you in whatever ministry or capacity that you serve in, as well as I. It's encouraging that we should build up the next generation of people that are going to follow after us. Because if we don't, just like for Timothy in Ephesus, just like for maybe you in your job, if you don't, things are going to fall apart. Paul warns Timothy that fierce wolves are going to come in from outside and inside the church to try and take and move people away. If you don't build up the other leaders around you, they're going to take your church away from you when you're gone. You and your job know this probably very well, that if you move jobs or when you move jobs, if you were to die, before you even have a funeral, the job listing is posted for your position, right? Your position, no matter how much you may think it is important to your business, no matter how much it may be important to your business, it is only for a short moment in time. And if you and if I don't engage in leadership training and leadership development, things are going to fall away whenever you die, move, retire. We, as a Christian, should be developing the next generation. That's in our households. That's in our committees that we have as a church that we're going to vote on today just to approve what the nominating committee has already done. This is important for all of us to develop leaders around us because it is too important for it to be built on one person. So what does Paul say that the responsibility of the office of pastor is, the pastors that are at Ephesus? Paul says that the pastor is tasked with teaching the word of God teaching the Word of God. When you look at verses 1 through 7, what you see is a list of characteristics, a character qualities that the pastor should have. But at the end of verse 2, Paul says one thing that is different than the rest. Pastors must be able to teach. Church, it doesn't matter how large this church is or other churches that you have been in. It doesn't matter if you have five people or 5,000 people. At some point during the service, it is an expectation that the pastor gets up and preaches, right? It is an expectation that at some point the pastor gets up to preach, and they do things that are maybe good, hopefully from the Word of God. That is the goal of almost every church service that you go to. That is the expectation of 
the pastor. Therefore, this is why the pastor must know the word of God. The pastor must know the word of God because it is the expectation that when the pastor stands up here to preach the word of God, that he is saying decent things that's actually built on scripture, not on his own thoughts, not built on cultural hot topics that are going on in the day. Although those things may come out at certain moments, the expectation is that we open the word of God, we read from it, And then the pastor then explains what the Word of God is saying so that you, as the members, understand the Word of God better so that you can apply it to your life. This is the expectation of what the pastor should do. This is why so often for church members, the pastor is expected to know everything. Every question that you may have, the pastor should know immediately, cold-footed, having not read through Ezekiel, whatever, and you're thinking about whatever it is that Ezekiel is thinking through why the pastor, whatever your Sunday school class is going through, you come to your pastor and you ask questions. What does this mean? How do I, how do I trans, translate this to my life? It's an expectation that the pastor knows the word of God. It's an expectation so often in so many churches that the pastor is able to decipher whether your children know Jesus or not. So whenever your children are interested in becoming baptized or whenever your children are interested in professing saving faith in Christ, you as a parent often Don't sit down with your child and ask them those questions that you probably know just as well. You defer to the pastor. You bring them to the pastor's office. Can you please sit down and talk with my child? It is the expectation that the pastor knows the word of God. So a lot of churches have the expectation that the pastor goes to seminary. Whether or not they learn anything or not is irrelevant. It's just a matter whether the pastor goes to seminary or not because they need to know the word of God. And so often when the pastor enters the room in a Sunday school class or a small group, it's like your biblical knowledge just goes away. And you have to ask the pastor for assurance or affirmation on every single question that you may have. This is the expectation of pastors, good, bad, wrong, or indifferent. Pastors should know the word of God. Furthermore, the pastor should be able to communicate the word of God effectively, hopefully, Again, the expectation is that when the pastor stands up to preach the word of God, he does it so in an effective way. Whether it's by points or poems, it doesn't matter. Your expectation as a church is that the pastor is a good communicator. This is why so often churches default to that when you hire a pastor, they must stand up and the pulpit committee maybe has listened to some sermons and maybe they're happy with the pastor speaking or not. But when it's time for the pastor to be called to the church, what does the pastor do? You don't sit down and interview the pastor to judge over the characteristics that are listed out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You judge them based on one sermon. Well, if I'm a pastor and I have any smarts to me whatsoever, I am dusting off the best of the best that I have. And I am bringing that before you as a church to make sure that when you vote on me, when you vote on your next pastor, you're going to hear the best sermon that I have to give. Having no clue normally what the pastor actually believes about the Word of God. It's just a sermon. Because you just expect for them to communicate effectively. Might I just say also, just a confession, transparency, like I'm lying the rest of the time outside of this, I'm not. Just a transparent moment. You understand how difficult it is to stand up here and give a book report every single week? Some of you loved doing this in school, right? You loved giving book reports for your classmates. Everybody has read The Great Gatsby or whatever book that your class is reading. Everybody has read it, yet you were tasked to stand up for five minutes and give a book report and act like you were bringing out something new that nobody has ever heard about from The Great Gatsby before, right? This is what pastors do every single Sunday. Every single Sunday we stand up here and we give a book report on 1 Timothy chapter 3 and your expectation, right or wrong, for the pastors is that they're communi- communicating effectively. Maybe they're funny and they tell some good jokes. Maybe they're passionate enough to keep me awake because Lord knows I'm not interested in the word of God any other way. Right? This is the expectation on us. It is difficult to take and sit and do a book report every single week. The pastor is tasked with communicating God's word effectively. And here I want to, before we continue, I want to acknowledge something again here before we continue. And I acknowledge that this is, Word of God has been written 2,000 years before this became a hot topic issue, but I want to acknowledge it here before we continue because it must be stated that the office of pastor is reserved specifically in the Word of God for men and men only. Never in Scripture do you see the office of pastor being held by a woman. Now, that is not my interpretation, that's not my thoughts, that's the Word of God. 
Never have you seen in Scripture a woman holding the office of pastor. And I understand that it is a hot topic right now. I understand it is a difficult topic. And I'm not diminishing a woman's ability to stand up and communicate the word of God. I'm not diminishing a woman's ability to be able to understand the word better than men do. That is not what Scripture is saying. But specifically, Scripture is saying, and the word of God is communicating, that the office of a pastor is held only by men. Why does Paul make a big deal about this? Because if you look in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 5, when you look at it in Titus, when you look at it in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, when you look at these things, it is a matter of biblical authority and it is a matter of authority in the home. Paul says this over and over again. In fact, Paul says that the office of a pastor, what goes on in a family household, all of that reflects the relationship of God, that God the Father is over God the Son. It is a matter of biblical authority, and it is a matter of authority in the home. So I want to acknowledge this before we continue, because it is clear in Scripture. Again, where Scripture is not clear, we have room to disagree. We have room to move. But nowhere in Scripture do you see a woman holding the office of a pastor. We all together this morning? Okay, let us continue then. Second thing that we see pastors doing, pastors must model Jesus' character. Now, I can't go into all of these things that Paul lists out here, so instead I've grouped them together for us. Pastor must be able to model Jesus' character in his personal life. Paul says that a pastor must be above reproach, meaning that his personal life should not be a foothold for those outside the church or for Satan to grab a hold of. Should not be able to have room to question the pastor. Not that the pastor is perfect, but that the pastor is at least above reproach. There are no, no things that said about this pastor that could be in a bad or diminishing way. Paul also says over and over again in this passage that we read this morning in Titus that a pastor must be self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, and so much more. In other words, a pastor's personal life must reflect Jesus. Paul also says that a pastor's family life must be reflecting of Jesus. Now, Paul's words here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 says the husband of one wife, literally a one-woman man. The meaning of this is not necessarily in the quantity of wives, but the quality of his marriage. Let me say that again. The goal of what Paul is saying here is not the quantity of in the number of wives that a pastor has or doesn't have. And the same word here is used to pastor as it is of deacon. It's not the quantity, but it's the quality. Let me throw something out for you to think about. For example, if you found out that I was addicted to online adult content, you would certainly be, have room, grounds as a church to not want me to be your pastor anymore, right? That would be the expectation. It's not necessarily whether or not Amy forgives me or not and whether or not we stay married. That is not the goal. Now, again, if we want to hold a true biblical sense, sure, in an ideal, wonderful, perfect world, would it be amazing if every pastor and every deacon was only married once? Sure. But guess what? We're not in a perfect world. We're in a fallen world where people make mistakes Paul's goal here is not to say that the pastor should only have one wife, ever. Paul had those words in Greek to be able to know and say, never divorced. He didn't say that. So where we as a church may have room to disagree with other churches on this, our view at this church is that we view that the grace of God is sufficient to cover so many things. And that we as pastors, we as leaders, are not the judge God is. So we're going to have grace in these circumstances. We're going to have grace in these areas because Paul does not mean that they only ever have one wife. It is the quality of their marriage that we as a church should examine. It is the quality of the marriage of the pastor. It is the quality of the way that they lead their family that we should be judging. This is what Paul is intending. We should judge them by whether or not they model Jesus in their relationships with their spouses and with their children. This is Paul's goal and Paul's intent. Finally, we see that a pastor should have a good spiritual life. Their spiritual life should model what Jesus does and the way that they live out their lives. Church, uh, uh, just a confession and observing. Word of God is here. I'm stepping away. Maybe on a soapbox, maybe not. 
So many pastors today, so many churches today are consumed with making a name for themselves rather than making a name for Jesus. There are so many pastors and churches around right now that are much more apt to share about their own personal life on their own social media pages and trying to tie it into what the church is doing rather than making a name famous for Jesus. They're trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to do everything they can to climb a ladder in the church world to get to a larger church because it's more money, because it's more this, because it's more that. Their spiritual life is often lacking because they are trying to make a name so much for themselves. This is a danger that we as a church, in order to be healthy, must watch out for. Because if we're not careful, we're going to look at pastors and their giftedness, the way they're able to communicate, the way they're able to tell a joke, the way that they're funny. We'll look at all of those things and make that much more important than whether or not they are actually taking care of their spiritual lives and their relationship with Jesus. If we're not careful, we will be attracted to the person because their personality is so attractive that that's what we want as a pastor rather than because they love Jesus that much. We have to warn against these things because if we don't, we will put celebrities in the pulpit that will make a name for themselves and not for Jesus. This is not the goal and the, off, the reason that a pastor should be teaching the word of God. It is not for themselves. It should be for Jesus. So the third and final thing that we see about a pastor this morning is that a pastor should shepherd the church. Pastor's call is to shepherd the church. Now, we don't have time to read Acts chapter 20 this morning, a great passage to go and look up later to see this point laid out. A pastor is expected as the shepherd to guard the church, guard from those outside the church wishing to bring in false doctrines inside, wishing to take the church away from what the church's goal and mission is, take them away from the gospel. The pastor is charged as a shepherd to guard against these things. This is why we unashamedly stand on the word of God. Because you as the members, you as this church must know what the word of God says. We don't apologize for it. We, we may say things in a wrong way that maybe we could say in a better way sometimes. But we as pastors try to guard you, the flock, every single time we preach that you are getting the raw meat of scripture. And you stop eating on these Cheerios Silly, easy, digestible things that have no value to guard against what Satan is doing in this world. This is why we throw these things out for you to be able to be solid in the word of God. The church must be guarded by those outside and those inside. This is leadership 101 in Rick and I's mind. A pastor does not lead from the back. A pastor leads from the front. This is what Paul's meaning over and over again by the characteristics that we just talked about in the personal life and spiritual life and their family life. Pastor leads from the front. It is challenging and daunting for me to stand up here just like Paul said as pastor and said, follow me just like I follow Christ. That is challenging. Yet that is the call of the pastor. The call of the pastor by guarding the sheep is by leading from the front. That is how the pastor does these things. Paul also says that the pastor as the shepherd must nurture the church, must feed the church, must care for the church. And let me just say this here while we're here. Our goal when we stand up here and preach for 30 to 35 minutes on a Sunday, just like you don't only eat a meal on Sunday afternoon, you should not eat the Word of God only in a 30-minute timetable on a Sunday morning. Our goal, yes, is to feed and nurture the sheep. But we cannot do this on a 30-minute short scale on a Sunday morning if you are not in the Word of God. If you are not in the Word of God throughout the week, what we say on a Sunday morning may make sense or it may not make sense. Our goal is to feed you. Our goal is to feed you across all different kinds of spectrum. Some of you are very mature in your Christian life. Some of you are infants, yet we are tasked with the ability or the way to communicate God's word effectively so that we feed every single one of you out here with something that morning. It's okay for you to be an infant as a Christian, but you cannot stay that way forever, or you should not. For some of you, you have sat in church for so long understanding no more about the Word of God than the day that you first started coming. 
It is time to grow up. It is time to learn. It is time to get deeper into the Word of God so that you can understand more and more things so that whenever we stand up to communicate, now instead of being the bottom rung where we're throwing out cereal bits, now you're understanding the meat and potatoes. You're not all the way to the five-course meal yet, but you're making progress. This is Paul's task here, that we as pastors nurture the church over and over lovingly, caring for the sheep that are going on, when you have physical needs, when you have emotional needs, that we, as the pastors, are nurturing for you. So we've looked at pastors. Now let's look at the second office that we see here this morning, the office of deacons. Unlike the office of pastor, there's not a whole lot of information in the New Testament about what exactly deacons do. It is an office that Paul lists out here in 1 Timothy and in Titus, but there's not a whole lot of parameters around what the office of deacons do. So there's a lot of gray area open for interpretation about things that are in Scripture because it's not as clean cut throughout Scripture like the office of pastors are. So here are some things about deacons. What are they? I call deacons first responders. Because when you look in Scripture, what you see deacons doing is being the first ones in the church to stand up and say, I will help. I will help solve this problem. They are first responders in the way that they act, wanting to care for the sheep, wanting to protect those that are in their care here in this church. That's why they are first responders. So how are they first responders? They meet needs in the church. They meet specific needs that come up like in Acts chapter 6. Not the first deacons, but a model for what Paul lays out later on in life. They meet the specific needs of the church. Now, the specific needs of what was going on in Acts chapter 6 are not the same specific needs of what a church may have today because there's 2,000 years difference. 2,000 years from now, if Jesus has not come, the needs of the church may be entirely different. But the deacons are still called to meet the needs of the church in that time. So deacons meet the needs of the church. They also support their pastor in the church. This is not a blind obedience But this is a way for the deacons to support the ministry of the pastor. They're called to protect the pastor's role so that the pastor can then preach and effectively communicate God's word so that their time is not bogged down with, like in Acts chapter 6, waiting tables and taking care of widows. Maybe in today's culture so that the pastor is not bogged down with constant meetings about X or taking care of the property, cutting the grass, pulling the weeds, whatever. That is the role of the deacons is to make sure that they are protecting the pastor's time so that the pastor can effectively communicate God's word so they can take care of the needs of the church in ways that the deacons cannot. Furthermore, it is a responsibility of the deacons to protect the pastor's time so that the pastor, they can make sure the pastor is held accountable to preaching the word of God. This is why Paul says that they must hold the faith with clear conscience. That's what it says in the back end of verse 9. The deacons must hold the faith with good conscience. The deacons must know the word of God to be able to hold the pastor accountable in some way to the word of God. So when the pastor is straying outside of the word of God, at least there's somebody in the church that the church sees as good biblical leaders so they can make sure that the pastor is communicating effectively, that the pastor is keeping the gospel at the center of the church. This is all things that makes for a healthy church. The final thing on deacons is that deacons should also, just like the pastor, model Jesus' character. And I'm not going to go back through those things with you. You can read back through them and see how Paul is saying how deacons should have the same character qualities, similar character qualities as a pastor. Now, church, let me pause here before we continue on. When you look through 1 Timothy chapter 3, when you look through Titus chapter 1, when you look through the qualifications to be an elder, a pastor, and a deacon, these qualifications, I would suggest, are no different for us than they are for you in your life. Like, these things aren't very difficult. Every Christian should be solid on the Word of God. Every Christian should have a good family life, a good spiritual life, a good personal life that reflects Jesus. These things aren't bizarre or out there. Nowhere in Scripture do you see, in order to be a pastor or a deacon, you must go to seminary. Or in order to be a pastor or a deacon, you must dress this way. You don't see these things in Scripture. The character quality matters so much more than the competency. The character of deacons and pastors and leaders within the church matters so much more than their competency. 
God does not call the equipped, because if he, do, if he did, I would have never been called. I am just as ill-advised, just as dumb so often as many of you. I've seen your lives. I've heard your stories. You've heard many of mine so often. We, as a church, do not call pastors or deacons because they are perfect people. We call them because some, we see some way that God is moving in their lives. And God has changed their lives radically. God did not call Rick because he was perfect. God called Rick because he was willing. God did not call me because I am perfect or understand the word of God perfectly. He called me because I was willing. And he has a design for our lives. This matters when we look at people who we select as leaders in the church. Because their character matters so much more than how flashy they are, how good dressed they look, how well attractive they are, how funny they are whenever they communicate God's word. None of those things necessarily matter. But so often that's the only thing that churches judge pastors by. And just as a point, raise your hand if you've ever been hurt by a church before. You you can stick your hand up. It's okay. It's a safe space. Raise your hand if you've been hurt by a pastor before. Raise your hand if you have been hurt by someone who has been in a leadership position in the church and it's hurt your family because of the lack of character qualities, because they've gotten driven away, pulled away because of money. They've been pulled away because of other women. They've been pulled away because of a host of number of other things. Raise your hand if you've been a part of one of those churches. The character matters so much more than whether or not he is flashy when he's preaching the word of God. Because your lives matter. Because the pastor is called to lead and shepherd you. Yes, he's called to communicate the word of God, but he's called to protect you above all. So as we looked at these things, what's the point? Maybe some of you are thinking all this. I'm glad you asked that question because it's actually next in my notes. What is the point of all of this? That is great. Look with me in verses 14 and 15 again. What does Paul say? Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, Timothy. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, what does Paul say here? So that you, Timothy, you as the church may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Paul says that these offices, these issues that come up, the gospel, prayer, leadership within the church are all the foundations for the church, that the church must be built on. Paul says that the church is the pillar and buttress of truth, the supporting things. The church is the supporting system of God that should be a sign for non-Christians to see how we as Christians behave in the household of God. So that people will see how we as Christians ought to behave in our lives so that they can look at the pastor, they can look at your homes, the way that you treat your families, the way that you look to the word of God, the way that you spend time in prayer and the word of God. They should be able to see that from their leadership and from you as church members so that they can say, yep, y'all are different somehow. I want a piece of that. I want to understand more about how you can love somebody who did that to you because you're living your way, your life as a Christian. We as a church should devote ourselves to keeping and guarding these things because it's primary. We as a church should guard and protect this church to make sure that deacons don't become a board of elders, a board of trustees rather, so that everything has to pass through them as if they are some kind of political power players in the church. That is not what Paul outlines. Paul also does not outline to make sure that we as a church are protecting, the pastors are protecting the church members, not exploiting them for their own gain. We as a church have to do this or else Satan can enter the life of the pastor and the life of the church and tear us away. The church should be the shining light of the world when pastors are devoted to gospel and prayer, when the deacons are devoted to supporting the ministry of the church and the spread of the gospel, when you as the members are devoted to those things and making sure that your leadership carry those things as primary. This is what Paul is outlining for a healthy church to be built on. It is important for all of us in here to make sure that we understand this 
thing so that we can make sure that this church at Hepzibah that meets at 2701 Henderson Highway can make sure that the word of God is proclaimed. The gospel is faithfully preached. We are devoting ourselves to prayer. We are devoting ourselves to building up ourselves spiritually so that we can feed you. I can't feed you unless I am feeding myself. I can't feed you unless I am raising my own spiritual life to a point of not elevation above you like I know so much more than you. But if the word of God is not feeding me, I can't feed you. The same would be true of every person here in a leadership position, whether you teach Sunday school class, whether you help out in children's church, it doesn't matter. If you are not feeding yourself, you can't help your kids or your family. You can't help this church. You must Feed yourself on the word of God so that you can grow in your life. And may we pray that God will continue to call pastors and deacons to be able to make sure these things are a priority here at this church. And if and when you go to other churches, when you move off or you, God calls you to another church here in Troy, you need to make sure that you are at a church that prioritizes the gospel and prayer, where the leader is not devoted to building up a name for themselves, but they're devoted to building you up as church members. This is so important because so many of us have been hurt by churches or by pastors who have swerved, who have gone to other goals, who have prioritized other things that build themselves up rather than build you as the church up. This is important because all of our lives are at stake. It is important for you to keep me accountable. It is important for you to keep Rick accountable. This is vital to the church's health. And if, Lord willing, we are going to grow in this community, if we're going to grow with people coming to know Jesus here at this church, it has got to be through the leadership of myself and Rick and Kelly and Tim, making sure that we feed ourselves so that we could feed you. This is a priority, and it must be. Would you stand as we close? God, we lift your name on high. God, we thank you for how awesome and mighty and holy you are. God, it is a challenging and daunting task to be able to stand up here and look at my own life and see whether or not my character fits the qualities of a pastor that you have called us to be. God, it is challenging to stand up here and think about how we as a church can make sure we hold our pastors and our deacons and our leaders accountable. God, I pray that it will be convicting in our own lives for us to make sure that we prioritize the word of God in our lives, to make sure that we can hold ourselves and our leaders accountable. God, I pray that as we sing, as we close, you will lift up our voices to you because you are the one worthy. You are the one who deserves all praise. It is in your holy name we pray. Amen.